that you my king would die for me amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor gracious and good to have you all aboard this evening. I have a lot to share this evening in this study on intercession and I don't want to waste a lot of time uh, because I think it's vitally important to the day in which we live. This position, this place that we come to in our study of intercession. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Buddy and Julia are with us this, this evening. It's it's so good to have you guys. I, I love you so much. Pam, it's a pleasure to have you as well. Uh, Sherry's on board. We're going to uh, you know, go ahead and let us know if you're there. You have a prayer request. Please go ahead and get it to us and uh, put it up there. We'll make sure we take time to get that out. But this is, this is really an important aspect of intercession. We're looking at Daniel's prayer for uh, the nation of Israel. In Daniel chapter 9, one of the greatest pictures, uh, full, full picture of intercession that we have in all of Scripture. And it is that position that we take up uh, to stand in a gap between a holy God and, and an unrighteous people that he might spare uh, the land. As we looked at this, we began uh, looking at several elements. The first thing we looked at uh, is that uh, Daniel's prayer was in response to the Word of God. He prayed in response to God's Word, to what God was saying to him. He based everything he did upon the Word of God. God had shown him that the 70 years of, uh, of judgment, captivity in Babylon had come to an end. He was released to begin praying for Israel. The second thing we looked at is that his prayer was dependent upon God's character. Daniel's petition is God-centered at all times. Not man-centered, but God-centered. Uh, 19 times, or, or even more, but, but I think 19 times, reference is made to God, while man is referenced only about 11 times. Uh, he references and prays according to the veracity, the, uh, the truthfulness of God, and his faithfulness. In Daniel 9, in verse 4, he says, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandment. 
the next thing is he appeals to uh, uh, Daniel's or to God's uh, uh, righteousness and His mercy. He knows that He is a righteous God and a merciful God, uh, and and showing His mercy and tender love toward us from generation to generation. The third thing that we looked at last week was that Daniel's prayer was based on appeal and appeal for his glory. Though Daniel is there, uh, 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 though God is there with us, uh, the greater fact is that he has created us for him. And when we act in our own best interest, we, we always do it at the expense of others. But when God acts, it's as in, in his own best interest it's for his glory and it is always for the good of those who are called according to his purpose therefore in daniel's position in da uh, petition in daniel 9 and verses uh, 17 through 19 he says now our god hear the prayers and petitions of your servant for your sake lord look with favor on your desolate sanctuary give ear our god and hear Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make the request of you because of we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear. Lord, act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city, your people, who bear your name. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to this time of our prayer service, we want to remember those who are, are plugging in and will be a part, those who will pick it up later. Pray for them, Lord. Pray for your blessing upon their lives. That, Lord, pray that you each of us will have open ears and heart to hear and receive what the Spirit wishes to tell us tonight. Lord, we acknowledge that you are great and sovereign and good and awesome and mighty. We also acknowledge, Lord, that we are living in desperate and dangerous times, times when we're seeing change that, uh, Lord, is not change for the better, not change for the good, change for change's sake, but change according to man's principles and not according to yours. Lord, there's, there's shouts of good things, but, Lord, what is coming out of those shouts of good things are some very bad and evil and wicked things. So we come, Lord, tonight to hear your instruction to our heart and how we must pray for ourselves, our families, our churches, our cities, our nation, Lord, that we might see revival come in our day, that you might do it again, Lord, as you've done it in the past. To you we praise, to you be all the honor that we can give you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Carry us through. We leave this prayer meeting open for you, Lord. Thank you. Donna has come on board as well. It's good to have you here, Donna. So we're going to look at the fourth, uh, and, and maybe in some ways the most difficult, in fact, I think it probably is, the most difficult element of intercession. And is Daniel identified unselfishly with God's people? He identified with what went on in the nation of Israel. On... Uh, one of the, the most consistent marks of intercessors in Scripture is their ability to identify with God's people. In Daniel 4, or 9 and verses 4 through 6, which are central to our text, we will look at verse 7 as well. He said, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenants and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside for your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Uh, Dolores was in a car accident, really, and her car was badly damaged, and she, was she hurt, was she damaged, or was it just a car? Uh, if you could let us know that, Donna, that would be helpful. Uh, uh, she was shook up, all right, but no injuries, good. 
All right, remember, remember Dolores. She's trying to get moved back over on this side of the mountain from the coast and is looking for a place over here. And we'll be anxious to have her home with us again. But remember her in prayer. I want to highlight the main features of this portion of Daniel's prayer. These verses are an expression of Daniel's repentance and confession of sin for himself and for his fellow Jews. Daniel doesn't minimize either his sin or the sin of his fellow Jews. He uses a wide variety of expressions to, to describe sin in its various manifestations. Look at verse 5, uh, the core of this. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances, she was hurt, but don't know how badly. Okay, thank you, Donna. So she was hurt. So we want to pray for her. I'll try and reach out to her later and get her. Daniel begins with these words, we have sinned. Now, what is interesting here is Daniel includes himself as a sinner, even though God considers him as one of the most righteous men in the Old Testament, along with Noah and, and along with Job. There is an important principle in this passage that you need to see. The greater a person's knowledge of and intimacy with God, the deeper will that person's commitment and the more overwhelmed he or she will be with their own sense of sinfulness and the sinfulness of those around, the nation around them. We see this dynamic in Nehemiah as well. Now, Nehemiah was born in captivity. But now he comes to a place where God has, has burdened him greatly now for the condition of, of Jerusalem. And listen to his as he begins his prayer. Let your ear now be attentive to, and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you day and night on behalf of the sons of, uh, of Israel and uh, your servants. Confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house of sin. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept your commandments, nor your statutes, nor your ordinances, which you commanded your servant Moses. So he identifies himself with the overwhelming sin of the people, though he himself may not have been involved in some of those sins. We also see it in Paul as, as uh, he grew in the knowledge of God. Remember, Paul think, started out thinking of himself of a very righteous man. He came to Christ and he began, we see the closer, more intimate his relationship, the more he begins to change. He says he is the least of the apostles. From there he goes on and, and later on in his life he writes, he says the, he's the very least of all the saints. And toward the end of his life, Toward the end of his life, as he writes young Timothy, he says this is a trustworthy statement, deserving of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. You see, sometimes you can almost tell how close a person is in their relationship and their walk with Christ when they look around and they, they can point out all the sins of people, but it's their sin and they cannot identify with it in their own life. Well, they did. I didn't do that. But you notice that these people, the closer they got to God and the more they were burdened, the more they began to identify not only their own sin, but they identified themselves with the sins of the people. Daniel's confession of sin might seem phony to a lot unless they begin to really realize how passionately and completely he focused himself upon God. Now here's the second uh, great principle that you see in this passage. The more focused on Christ we are, the more we, the, the more we see ourselves as the sinful creature that we are. You see, when compared to God, even the most righteous among us fall short. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah 6, when he's in the presence of God, and what happens? He cries out, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm coming apart. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I, I live among a people of unclean lips. You see, I firmly believe that the better a man, uh, a, a better, uh, the better a person's own character becomes, the more joy they have in the Lord in their own heart, 
the more capable he or she is uh, of being honestly sympathetic and sorrowful, and the more fervent he or she will be in identifying with the sins of a nation. Daniel continues through here to use the pronouns we and us uh, throughout this section uh, where he conf confesses sin, providing a model for any of us who would seek to intercede for our nation during this time. How easy would have it have been for him to blame the plight of Judah on some ungodly king uh, that led Judah astray? But he didn't seek to, to, to place blame. On the contrary, he was willing to shoulder the blame. I need to remember and emulate Daniel's pattern of prayer instead of blaming ungodly leaders for the plight of America. Isn't it so easy to point our finger at them and never really consider pointing the finger at our, us? I don't know, somebody said, and, and, and I heard it, I guess, uh, on the radio the other day, that remember when you point a finger at someone, three are pointing back at yourself. Well, that brings us to the third principle that we see in, in this, uh, uh, well, Dan Daniel confesses all manner of sin. In Daniel 7, uh, he, pictures the se he gives us seven pictures of the sinful behavior uh, which make up his desire to fully confess every sin that he could that would be brought to his heart. He wanted to be certain that nothing would impede his communication with God. And here's your third principle. Uh, coming to God with unconfessed sin means that those prayers are unheard and therefore they're unanswered. Uh, we cannot come to God without being right with God and expect him to hear us and respond to us. Psalm 66 and verse 18 is very clear. If I regard iniquity or wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Nothing hinders my prayer life or your prayer life like iniquity harbored in the heart. We're like Cain that way. Sin lies in our door and it blocks the passageway. Proverbs in 15 and 29 is really clear. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Proverbs 28, 9 says, He who turns away an ear from listening to the law, even his prayers are what? They're an abomination. Can you think of anything stronger than that? Listen to this. He who turns away his ear from listening to the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Well, look at Daniel's confession and what he does. He uses the word sin here, and that's the word uh, kata. And you'll see, I, I've listed the other places in Daniel 9 where he uses this word. It means to miss the way or to miss the mark. It's the word that we commonly associate with sin. The literal sense of kata is found in Judges where we read that there were 700 choice Benjaminite men who were all left-handed. you remember the story of them? And each one could sling a stone at a rabbit and not miss? Kata, that word miss. In other words, they were sharpshooters. They could hit their target every time they slung the stone. Israel forgot God. Israel forgot God's law. Israel made up new gods, and Israel made up new laws. They flung the stone, and it missed by a mile. Then he says, we committed iniquity. Now, the word iniquity there is, is avra, and it, 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 it strictly means to bend or twist or distort. Just simply take and twist the truth a little bit. Just tweak it a little bit, in other words. Here it's used in a figurative sense of bending the law of God, twisting it for my purposes. 
This is the verb used by David about himself in Psalm 51 and verse 2 as he confesses his infidelity and his subsequent murder of Uriah. He asked God to wash him of his iniquity. You see, David was perfectly right. The law allowed him to go ahead and be on the roof, if you will, uh, uh, and not be out at battle. He was the king. He could have been wherever he went to. Although most kings would have been out with the troops, he was at home. He beheld Bathsheba. Now, he looked at her. He could have walked away, but he lusted after her. He took her. When she got pregnant, he tried to trick Uriah. Now, listen, folks. He had every right as king to send Uriah into battle. But you see, he used his right to twist, to bend, and ultimately cause the death of Uriah. Do we tweak? Do we bend the word to, to mean what we want it to mean? Say what we want it to say? Somebody said, oh, you can get the Bible to say anything you want to. Yeah, if you tweak it, if you bend it, if you twist it, put together a course of study years ago called Scripture Twisting, and just how cults do that, but Christians do it as well. Then he uses the term, he says, uh, he uses the term committed iniquity, chava, oh, I gave you that one, acted wickedly, rather, excuse me, uh, uh, come on, change, act wickedly, the word is asha, rasha, and it means to be wrong or to violate. Krasha describes a misdeed, such as when King Jehoshaphat tolerated an allegiance, uh, an alliance with evil King Azahiah. You see, he violated God's prohibition to align himself with an evildoer, which caused God to destroy his ships as a sign of his displeasure. And then <coughs> Daniel used the word rebel, and that's chmerchad. And that means simply to oppose or to disobey one who is in authority or in control. Webster defines rebellion as express and open resistance against <coughs> authority. Excuse me. Mahad is used by Joshua and Caleb when they urge Israel to accept their report that the land of Canaan was exceedingly good land and to not rebel shod, against the Lord. The essence of rebellion is shrinking back in unbelief. It's a denial of God's word. It's preferring our own notions of what is right and what is wrong. Do you see that capturing our culture? Have we not shrunk back and, and, and uh, in unbelief, have we not denied the word of God, preferring our own notions, our own concepts, our own definitions of what's right and what's wrong? In this use of Barad that we found in Numbers, God dealt with Israel's rebellion by shutting them out of Canaan for 40 years. The next term that he uses is the term, let's see, where, where are we? Turning aside. And that's the word her. It literally means to physically turn away. It's used by Daniel figuratively to describe God's people turning away from his commandments and ordinances. In short, Israel committed apostasy, which was ex exemplified by, by the, in the time of the Judges, where you could read a summary statement in Judges chapter 2 and verse 17, when it says this. It says, uh, yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot after other gods. Man, is that not a picture of our day? and bowed themselves down to them. We play the harlot to money, to entertainment, to pleasure, to all kinds of things, and bow down to them. They turn aside, there's the word her, quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. Good evening, Sue. Now he moves on in verse 6. And in verse 6, he says, Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, 
the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. As if it were not enough, Daniel says, moreover, meaning added to all of this. Okay, I've given you all of these, these five things. Now I'm going to add to it. The people had turned a deaf ear to the warnings graciously provided to them by God through the prophets or preachers that he had sent. All of Judah doubtless had heard the words of the prophet, prophets, and yet they repeatedly refused to heed the warning and repent. Go back to, to where judgment came in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 32 and verses 32 to 33, he says, Because of all the evil the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah, which, have, which they have done that provoked me to anger, they, their kings, their leaders, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, listen to verse 33, they have turned their back to me and not their faces. Though I taught them, teaching again and again and again and again and again, they would not listen and receive instruction. It's not that they couldn't hear, they couldn't listen, but they deliberately made the choice not to hear. Earlier in Jeremiah, the prophet tells us the state of this rebellious nation. One of my favorite Jeremiah chapters is chapter 6. Starting verse 16, he says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the way and, and see and ask for the ancient paths. Where is the good, where the good way is? And walk in it. You will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. And I set watchmen over you. Listen for the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not listen. Moreover, or therefore, Hear, O nation, and know, O congregation, what is, among, uh, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their plans, because they have not listened to my words, and as for my law, they have rejected it also. I want those words to penetrate, because do you realize Jeremiah and Daniel, both of them, could be speaking to the United States of America today. That's as fresh and alive and as, as relevant today as it was back then. <clears throat> over and over and over, the word that is used here uh, and, and all through uh, Daniel 9 is the word Shema, which you know means to have a listening ear. In other words, to hear with the intent to obey. What he was saying in the context of this is that they were deliberately plugging their ears so they were refusing to hear by which every action was to refuse to obey. In verse 7, Daniel refers to Israel's unfaithful deeds. He says, righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us, open shame. As it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all of Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, in all the countries which you have driven them, in other words, the total dispersion of both north and southern kingdoms, because of their unfaithful deeds, which they have committed against you. Daniel cries out, proclaiming that righteousness belongs to you, to you, O God. You're the only righteous one. And it seems clear that Daniel wants to make it absolutely certain that the consequences of the suffering uh, that, that, that Judah has suffered under are in no way God's fault. The people had brought it on themselves. You see, God is perfectly righteous in all his ways. God had not failed Israel. Israel had failed God and had failed to seek his kingdom and seek his righteousness. And God was perfectly righteous in bringing shame upon the people and scattering them for their unfaithful deeds. Daniel confesses that God has put them to open shame. You might want to underline that word, 
write it in your journal. The literal transmission means shame on the face. Have you ever been embarrassed and blushed? That's what it is. That's what he's talking about. You see, the Hebrew word for shame is moseth. It conveys a sense of humiliation, of disgrace, and the accompanying feeling of guilt and embarrassment. Now, I know it's not politically correct especially in, in this day and age. After all, we live in a shameless society, don't we? Filled with shameless people who really do shameless things. The whole idea of shame seems to belong to another generation, another time, another place. You see, we're not ashamed of anything anymore. We don't blush because we're not embarrassed, because we have a, we've seen it all, we've heard it all, and for some, we may have done it all. As a people, we simply dislike the notion of shame. After all, that's just so Old Testament. It's, it's so uh, uh, old-timey, but uh, this is the age of grace, and there is no need for shame, right? Well, wrong. Sin always brings shame. It always separates us in our, in our fellowship with God. And when we sin deliberately and repeatedly, we ought to be ashamed. We ought to be embarrassed by it. If we're not, it's because we have so seriously seared our conscience that it doesn't shame us or bother us anymore. Today we use words like, oh, I messed up, or I, I blew it, or oh, my bad. That's how we define sin. We make that definition, we trend it downward, don't we? We make it easy and appealing. After all, how bad can my bad be? It definitely not as bad as acting wickedly, is it? Daniel makes no excuses for their sin. Not once does he blame the dirty Babylonians or the miserable Philistines or the bigoted Republicans or the Marxist Democrats who led them into sin. He's not going to have any of that. No finger pointing, no blame game, no self-justification of any kind. Simply laying out all the ugliness of sin in all of its forms and shapes. No word games here. Just bare, raw, naked confession. i got to tell you, the application to the modern church in America ought to be clear to us. The application to where our nation is today ought to be crystal clear. We cannot blame God for the condition of our nation. The responsibility is laid at our doorstep. God instructed that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. He doesn't call the unrighteous. He calls the righteous to stand in the gap for their nation. We don't have unlimited time to get serious about this matter. I hope you realize the seriousness of the hour. We have today. We have now. Tomorrow may not come. As with Israel, their time ran out and judgment was certain. Has our time run out? As Paul admonishes young Timothy, we must proclaim the word and keep on proclaiming it with a sense of urgency. We must pray and keep on praying with that same sense of urgency for the destinies of our families, our churches, our communities, our state, our very nation depends upon it. We must continue, whether it's popular or not, whether it's convenient or not, and do it in season and out of season 
while the day is still called day for the night's coming when no man will work. Whew. Will you go with me to prayer? Great and awesome God, creator and stay sustainer of heaven and of earth. All glory belongs only to you. I worship you, Lord, in the splendor of your holiness. I, I praise you because you are mighty. You are powerful and loving and kind and faithful and full of grace. I thank you that you will, will, will break through the dry and, and hardened areas of my own heart and, and the heart of, of, of those your people and even to the heart of our culture. Oh, Father of all mercies, God of all comfort, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness all your loving kindness to us and in, in, to, to all that, that, Lord, you have made. Oh, gracious, sovereign God, we have sinned. We have deliberately missed your glorious way. We have bent and distorted your word to suit our own unlawful purposes. We have acted wickedly by, by uh, willfully violating your word and openly rebelling against your sovereign authority even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, Lord, we have willingly chosen not to listen to the gracious warnings that you have given us year after year after year through your word and by those who have faithfully proclaimed your truth throughout this land. Oh, Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but the Lord really open shame belongs to us. The pity of all, of it all, oh, gracious God, is that we have become so calloused as a people that we no longer are even capable of blushing for the hideous and unrighteous deeds that are done and all unrighteousness which are committed against you. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Wash us clean. Make us to be whiter than snow. And now, our God, hear our prayers, hear our petitions, hear the pleads of your servants. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate people who bear your holy name. Give ear, our God. Give ear and open your eyes and see the desolation of our land. See what has come upon us because of our callous, self-indulgent ways. I do not ask your re these requests, Lord, because we are righteous, but, Lord, because of your great mercy and loving kindness. Lord, listen. Oh, Lord, we plead for Gliv. Lord, hear our cries and act. For your sake, O oh God, for your glory, do not delay, because your people bear your name. Hear, O oh, hear, O oh God and heal our land. We pray in Jesus' name, under the authority that he has given to us as we come under his sovereignty and pray, amen and amen. Well, one of the things that I do in the mornings that I never done on a, on a Wednesday night, I would like to do this night. I want to just give you a little practice. I'd like your help. If you would, I'd like you to look once again at, at those verses, chapter 9, 4 through 7. Refresh yourself with what each of those terms are saying. And then would you begin to make a list of how you see that our nation has fallen into those categories? And if you would please, would you at some point during this week, maybe before, before the weekend, uh, could you e email me, send me that list? I'd like to compile the list for future study and future reference. So I'm requesting your help to do that. Just go over those verses and what those terms mean and what all through this passion, through, through verse 15, Daniel is pleading before a righteous God, laying these over and over before him and expanding on them. A 
compare them to where our nation is, what you see in our land, and then email me the results, and I'll put that kind of together, and, and I really would like to use it if you do that for me. I'd like to tell you good night, and God bless. You have a wonderful evening, and I'll be back with you at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. God bless you. Have a great, great evening. See you tomorrow.